Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18. Be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And having prepared everything to take your stand, stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray at all times in the spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this thank you for this opportunity for us to come together and worship you in spirit and truth. May the sermon today be what you once said and how it's said. May you remove all human motive and only uh, leave the motive that comes from your spirit to guide all of us to truth, to consideration, to grow closer to Christ, to hear your word and to consider and to desire to put it to action. I pray that we all leave today convicted, wanting to do more for the kingdom that you have given us. And it is through your son's name, Jesus, that we say, amen. Well, this year we have been talking about the purpose of the church. And we've been talking about the three works of the church. And in Matthew 4, 23, they're laid out. There's evangelism, there's edification, and there is benevolence. And the way that we've been framing this is disciple makers, keepers, and healers. And we've talked about what it means to be a disciple healer. We've talked about what it means to be a disciple maker. And today, we're going to talk about what it means to be a disciple keeper. And each one of the three works of the church, I've kind of assigned key purpose words to them. For the healer, it is healing and peace. That's what we're trying to produce when we bring healing through Christ to someone. We want to produce healing and peace. For the maker, it is bringing freedom and forgiveness to the gospel. And for the keeper, it is about endurance, encouragement, that produces engagement. And today, I want us to focus on what it means to be a disciple keeper. But keep in mind this, is that Jesus' threefold ministry Focus on all three because it's his full personality that cares about all three of these ministries. And so as we grow in Christ, we develop in all three of them. But because we're human and we're not perfect across the board like Jesus, we're going to have a strength in one of them over the others. And so what I'm hoping for this series is that you are all each reflecting and listening about the three works of the church and trying to figure out where is my strength and where do I need to grow in? What are the skill sets that God has given me to help me be a servant in his kingdom? And so I want us to focus on the disciple keeper this morning. And I want to talk about six characteristics that they have. They're determined. Now let me explain that. They're determined because they don't give up on people. In fact, they have a stubbornness about them. In fact, I was going through the Adjace app Last night, and I was looking through the members, and boy, God has blessed this church. We have grown. But I became saddened when I saw many people in that app that I know we taught them the gospel, and they're not here this morning. They're not here. They haven't been here for a while. And I know there's some of us here who have been stubborn, and occasionally you reach out to them because you're determined that you will not give up on them. That is a characteristic of a disciple keeper. Another one is that they're goal-oriented. They're strategic. They're long-game thinkers. Why? Because they recognize you're starting here when you come into the body, and this is where we want to get you. What's that end goal, Jesus Christ? What's the process to help you get from here to there? They're goal-oriented. 
And like the other two, they're compassionate. They extend compassion because they know that you need Christ and you need to grow in him. They're encouraging and motivating. They're the people that you want to call up when you're going through a hard time because you know that they're going to help bring you to a passage to think about what you're going through. You know they're going to pray with you to encourage you to stay on the path. And here's an interesting characteristic. They're teachable. The best teachers are teachable. How do you know? That's how they became a good teacher. They had to learn. But a disciple keeper is always remaining in the state of being taught because we always have more to learn and more to grow. And finally, like the other two, they're patient. But it's a different type of patience. It's a patience that's more like a parenting patience. Parents, you know what I'm talking about? When you first receive your child in the world and then you raise them, and I'm only about two years in with Ben. Uh, Abby's 11, and we got a new one that's just a few months old. But you have to be patient because you know this isn't where it stops. This is where it is right now, and you have a plan to help them get further down the line because you know where it's going. Now, people who have the gift of disciple keeping tend to gravitate to certain jobs. And there's a lot more, but um, these are some of the general ones that I thought of when putting this together. Uh, The first one on the list is they gravitate to jobs as teachers. Now, the Ridge has been blessed. We have some incredible teachers here. And I think teachers are some of the most underappreciated people in our culture and our society. I mean, it is often your responsibility to build up a whole generation and teach them and instruct them. But you're drawn to that because that's what you want to do. And we have men and women here who are astounding at teaching. Why? Because we need disciple keepers. And God has blessed us mightily with disciple keepers here at the Ridge. Often these people are, they gravitate to tradesmen or craft-oriented businesses or services. And the reason why I put that on the list is because a lot of craftsmen and tradesmen, they have to mentor a lot. If you want to be successful in a trade, you better put in a mechanism to train someone at what you do in order to keep the business going forward. But mentorship, they're big on mentorship. It's not just about instruction. It's showing and having them practice and fail and learn. And also trainers. You know, I often think of physical trainers. You see this all the time, people who are wanting to lose weight. It's a good idea to find somebody to help motivate you to get you there to hold you accountable. If you want to get stronger, they're going to put you through exercises that are going to wear you out and make you stronger. Coaches have this gift. Can you imagine a coach over a team who didn't care about the individual development of his players? That is what it's all about. But collectively trying to get each player to grow and to get stronger to what? Make a better team. You have to have the skill of disciple keeping to be good at building a team. But the keeper's motives are these. They want to share what they have so you can do better and get better. They see the end at the beginning with you. Isn't that amazing? But that's the mind of God. When when we come into the body of Christ, when we're taught the gospel, when we come out of the water, God sees the end at the beginning. He calls his son and daughter at that moment. But do we really deserve that? He's going to take us to that point. But disciple keepers see the end at the beginning. They see your potential. They see what you can become when you can't see it. And I want us to go back to Isaiah 53 because I want to see the, I want to show the fruit of being built up and developing in Christ. And I think the best example is Christ himself. And Isaiah 53, I believe, shows all three of the works. It shows that by his stripes we are healed. You see the healing. We see that he died for our iniquities. You see the freedom and forgiveness. But look at keeping displayed here. This is the end result of edification and building up the body of Christ. Verse 7 of Isaiah 53. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter and like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. You know what this is talking about? He had endurance. 
He had long suffering. He could take a beating. What? Why? For us. The end result of disciple keeping is building up the individual in the church so that we can take on the hardships of, of this life. I don't know about you, but I'm not at that point where I can receive the punishment he received and stay silent. How did he do it? Because he was a master at long suffering. He was built up in his father and he was the perfect representation of God in the flesh. I want to go to a passage that really sums up the focus of a disciple keeper, a di- disciple keeper and that is in Romans 15. And I just want to read a few verses here. The first four. Romans 15, starting in verse one. Notice the wording in this verse. Now we who are strong have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not to please ourselves. Each one of us is to please his neighbor for his good. Notice this, to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself. On the contrary, as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. What is that saying? What was intended for you instead fell on Christ. That's the whole point. If we're going to be the body of Christ, we're supposed to suffer for each other. Occasionally when a blow of life is coming your way, I want to get in front of you to take that blow. That's part of helping each other build up and develop the body of Christ is putting the characteristics of Christ in action. Verse four, for whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction. That's why we need teachers. And that we may have hope through endurance and through encouragement from the scriptures. That's why it's so important for us to make sure that we come to Bible class And that we come to meet with our brothers because we need to hear the instruction of the word. Why? Because it helps us develop endurance. Endurance can be translated as long-suffering. I like perseverance, patience, and it also is for our encouragement. Why? Because what we're holding on to is the real deal. And everything that God says he's going to do, it's going to happen. Verse 5. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another according to Christ Jesus. You know what the end result of building up endurance and encouragement is in the body of Christ? Engagement, oneness. The whole point of building us up is so that we can become strong in our faith, that we can become strong standing in Christ, Christ in us and on us, so that we can be who we're supposed to be in the kingdom of God so that we can engage not only the church but the world itself and show them the difference. And it's this difference that I want to talk about. Jesus says in John 16, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome it. In some uh, verses in the Psalms it says life is short, And filled with many troubles. This is also found in Job 14. But the reality is, until Jesus comes, this world, this life will be difficult. And so scripture tells us, well, how do we put up with it? How do we deal with it? And there is this beautiful passage of scripture. There's so many great passages that talks about the edification of the church. But I want to dwell and I want to go deep into one passage specifically. Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 8. This is... But now put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old self, and the King James says the old man, with its practices, and have put on the new self. You are being renewed according to the image of your creator in Christ. There is no Greek in Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. You know, it's interesting, the language there for putting off and putting on is words that you would use for clothing. That before you came to Christ, you had some garments on that made it very clear who you are. It was an identifier of what you were about. 
And the things that he connects to those old garments has to do with negative, hurtful, sinful attitudes that produce a sinful character. And he's saying, now that you're a Christian, you take that off and you put on what? The new self, the new garment. And I want to go a little further because Paul goes further. And what is this garment? Well, spoiler alert, it's Christ. But he breaks it down for us to understand it. In verse 12, notice the wording here. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion. Same word there. In fact, the put on compassion here is the same word in the previous verses. And it is the same word in Ephesians 6 where it says put on the armor of God. Same word. Put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a grievance against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you all are also to forgive them. But notice verse 14. Above all, put on, that's that word again, love, which is the perfect bond of unity. In the original language, that word is talking about perfection and maturity. And what? In Christ. What's so interesting is he says put on, but he doesn't just mention one thing. He gives a whole list, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And then it shows us what it looks like, bearing with each other, forgiving each other. And it says put on one other thing. Love. Isn't that interesting? This whole put on concept. And I couldn't help but notice something. I started off the sermon today with reading Ephesians 6. And we're all familiar with the text. The armor of God. And we know in that text you have the belt of truth. You have the chest armor of righteousness. You have the, sandal the sandals of readiness of the gospel of peace. You have the shield of faith. You have the helmet of salvation, the sword, which is the spirit, the word of God. And often we forget the prayer section, but what I like to call the prayer section is it's our battle cry. It's prayer, praying at all times. That's our battle cry. But there was a part of the armor that stood out to me, the chest armor of righteousness. And if you go and you look at what that word righteousness means, it means living right, living favorably. And I couldn't help but see when I read Colossians chapter 2 or chapter 3 here, that when he starts naming compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and love to put on, he's really laying out righteousness. And I, and I, and I made this connection, so bear with me for a moment, of chest armor and putting on layers and I couldn't help but make a connection. How many of you have ever heard of Kevlar? Um, I actually have a real Kevlar vest <laughs> right here. And thanks to uh, Louis Aguilar, uh, this is a real Kevlar vest, light armor vest that our police officers here in Abilene use. And it's multi-layered depending on uh, the Kevlar and the layers here, but there's intentional layers put into place inside this armor so that when a bullet hits it, it spreads it out and it prevents the bullet from penetrating through the armor. And you need around about 20 layers of Kevlar to stop a nine millimeter bullet. And some cops walk around with an extra layer, and this is a steel plate with rubber on one side, and it goes right in front of the heart. And it's designed so that when that bullet comes, boom, it prevents it. Now, I've never been shot with one of these on, and I'm not going to give a demonstration today of what that looks like. But I have heard it hurts. Even though it saves you, it hurts. And if it hits you at a rib around right here, it's going to leave a severe bruising and probably even break a rib. But it'll save your life. But here's the thing. It takes multiple layers in order to stop the bullet. What if you take out some of those layers? It may slow it down, but it may go through. It might kill you. Now go back to Colossians 3 here for a moment. In verse 12, he says, put on, and then there's a plurality. It's almost like put on these layers. Why? Put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, love, have you ever met someone and they're really kind and gentle, but they're easily offended? They may struggle with having patience. They're not very good at long suffering. But have you ever met people who have certain qualities here, but if you lack others, it's still going to be easy to get you? 
In fact, notice the examples that it gives right after it lays out these layers. It says, verse 13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. Well, how do we do that? Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and love. I don't know about you, but dealing with people can be painful. Have you ever been offended? I have. Have you ever been with words offended? If you have your spiritual body armor on, sometimes words, they might hit you a little bit. In fact, it'll push you back, but it won't cut you. It won't give you a fatal blow. Why? Because you have compassion on, you have gentleness on, you have humility on, you have patience on, you have love. We need that to deal with each other. There are certain things that used to knock me over that don't knock me over anymore because as I grow in Christ, my body armor gets better. I didn't want to bring it up here, but this is light body armor. You can also get heavy body armor that helps against higher caliber bullets. I didn't want to bring that up here because it weighs like 35 pounds. It is heavy. But you have police officers, if they get a call, they know there's a certain rifle in the situation, they will put this on so that they can take the bigger bullets. Building up one another in the body of Christ is about building us up in Christ. And as we get stronger in Christ, the blows of the world weaken. They lessen. We're able to go in harder and more difficult situations because we're developed in Christ. We can take it. When I was younger, if someone called me stupid or dumb, that would hit me hard. It would knock me over. I would get offended. I would get upset. I would get defensive. Call me dumb now. It's not the same response. Because as I've gotten older, I've become less concerned about what people think about me. And I've become very sensitive in thinking, what does God think about me? Because if I want to be the right person to people, I need to make sure that I'm trying to be the kind of man God wants me to be. And so I can take blows and hits that would cripple me when I was younger. And now they might push me back a little bit, but I'm still standing on my feet. Why? Because I have compassion kindness, gentleness, patience, and love in Christ Jesus. Why do we need this spiritual Kevlar, so to speak? So that we can bear and suffer with one another, so that we can forgive one another, so that we can receive the peace of Christ in our hearts, so that we can be thankful, so that we can let the word of God dwell in us richly. By the way, this list is if you keep reading Colossians 3, Paul saying put on this new man, put on Christ, put, this is what it looks like, so what? So you can do these things, you can be these things. And on the list, it says, it starts talking about marriage. If you want to have a successful marriage, make sure you have put on the garments of Christ. Not just a few, but all of them, and you will have a good marriage. When you have this on, you can also be good sons and daughters. You can be good workers, and you can do all things in the name of Jesus Christ to his glory. And without them, you won't get very far. Some closing points here. Disciple keeping is about building up each other towards maturity in Christ. You see, the great mystery revealed is Christ in us. It's also Christ on us. The evidence that Christ is in us is how we live our lives. People can see the garments that are on us. You remember earlier it said in the text, it says that we, in verse 12, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly beloved, I don't want to skip past this part. When you recognize that God has chosen you, when you realize that he expects you to be holy, that means you're not supposed to be like everyone else. God's name is holy. It's set aside. We're supposed to be a different type of people. And then when you recognize that you're dearly loved, then Paul says, put on compassion. What is this saying? It's like saying, if you know you're in the army, put your uniform on. If you know you work at a job, put your uniform on for that job. When you know that you're chosen by God, when you know that you're expected to be holy and set aside by God, when you know that you're dearly beloved by him, then you know that you gotta get it on so that you can be what you need to be for life for the people here, because people depend on you to be what you need to be in Christ. Another point, growing in perseverance, the things that used to bring me down no longer bring me down. I now stand firmly with Christ. 
You ought to be able to look as you develop in the edification of the church, as you grow and you develop perseverance, as you become more encouraged by the body of Christ and you engage more, you ought to see spiritual growth. You ought to see the putting away of childish things and the standing and the maturity as an adult in Christ. You ought to be able to look back five years and say, there were some things I did there that I no longer do because I've grown up. Now, granted, even though you have grown much over the years, we still have much to overcome in Christ. And we will not be made perfect until the last day when the dead shall rise. But when that happens, his work will be completed. And until then, we continue towards perfection as Christ Jesus. Another point, because I'm growing in Christ, I know how to suffer. I can appreciate the hard times and the good. That's the power of having Christ and learning how to suffer. Wherever I go, I have put on Christ. The enemy may try to get me, but I stand safe and secure in the arms of Christ. It's that security. You know, Lewis tells me he wears this a lot of times during the day. When you have this vest on and you get out of your car as a cop, I bet you feel a lot safer. That's how we're supposed to be in Christ. But we got better body armor. Christ is perfect. If he is on us, who can hurt us? I know where I'm going when I die. Why? Because I'm in Christ. The enemy might take my life, but I got a promise of eternal life because he does not fail. And he is true to his promises. And I love this last point. It's not about where I started. It's all about where he's taking me. We need to all get excited about disciple keeping and look at someone. Maybe someone in here you struggle with. Put on the, the eyeglasses of God for a moment and try to think, where does God want to take that person that I'm struggling with right now? Because God's got a plan for them. Stop focusing, and I do this all the time. In fact, we do this in our marriages and relationships, but we get so caught up in where someone is right now that we lose sight of where God is trying to take them. Where is he trying to take this person that I'm having a difficult time with right now? People have a difficult time with me. Yeah. <laughs> My wife will let you know. But the great thing about being in a marriage with somebody who has faith in Christ is we both know we're maturing and growing in the spirit of Christ. It's not about where you are right now. It's about where you're going. And I love Isaiah 46 where it says this about God. He declares the end from the beginning. That means before he spoke a word, he already knew where we're taking us, where he's taking us. The question is, is do you want to get on board with that direction? And I want to close with this passage of scripture because you see the mindset of this. He sees the end at the beginning. It's Galatians chapter three, starting at verse 26. It says, for through faith, you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. That's forward thinking. Because we're not perfect yet, but he already sees us as sons and daughters of God. Verse 27, for those of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. The same word there for clothed is the same as in Colossians. It's the same as Ephesians 6. When you come out of that water, you're now in Christ and you're clothed with Christ. Why? Because God sees the end at the beginning. When you come up out of the water, you're now a child of God. And now we pursue a life worthy of that call. And as disciple keepers, the Remington Ridge, we're here to help build you up. We're here to help you grow in your long suffering, your patience, your endurance. We're here to encourage you when life gets hard. Why? Because we want to build each other up to a soldier of Christ so that we can engage one another in unity and we can engage the world with the gospel of peace. Amen.